much. As Trent said, my name is Keith, Keith Pavia. Um, my wife, Dee, is in the front row. Her real name is Dorothy. She goes by D. I call her Dorothy. I had to explain that because the last couple churches I was at, they, I would say, oh, yeah, my wife, Dorothy, and they were, like, giving me this weird look, like I had two wives. I don't have two wives. I have one wife, D or Dorothy, whatever you like, and I have one son of seven here, Brandon, and his girlfriend, Sarah, came out. We have seven boys. They're all over the the Valley, our little one is in the youth or the children's ministry right now, but they'll all be popping in and out, so you, hopefully you'll meet some of them throughout the, the months here. But uh, that's, that's me here in Fountain Hills. I was raised and born in upstate New York in Rochester. Uh, my mom is 100% Italian, and my dad is 100% Italian, so we were Roman Catholic. Um, that's it. That's all I knew, and you know, as soon as I could go to church, or by myself, my parents, I got my license, they said, go to church. We didn't go to church anymore, you know, my buddies and I would go, and we'd grab the bulletin, and then go get something to eat. So I really haven't gone to church, or didn't go to church from teenage, and late teenage years, until I was 37 years old. And I just wanted to share a little bit of, of my story, just how I got here. I, I, I believe it ties in perfectly with the command of Christ that we are hitting today. So bear with me. It is a cliff note version, I promise. If you want to know about me more, I love to talk. I love to share that. So please ask me and I will give you anything. You know what? Be careful because my wife even says sometimes I give too much. If you're right at the right time, I might give you my bank account number. I don't know. But I will talk. I'm on the sleeve. So please get to know me. Don't feel like you can't come up to me and ask me any questions you want. There's not going to be any crazy questions you can't ask me. So as I was growing up, I moved out here in 1994, not a believer, not going to church, living for myself. Whatever I could do, I coached college football back in New York and high school, and I coached high school football when I came here, and I taught um, high school PE, and whatever I could do to make me happy, that's what I did. So I've been divorced twice, and um, when I met my wife, um, I had three boys and she had three boys, and we got together, we had six boys, so it was kind of an awakening for me. We got together, and all of a sudden I had three, and that was pretty pretty hard to deal with as it is as a single dad and then we threw in together six and it was it was just amazing to me and I share that because um, of growth and of, of challenge of things I had to go through so we were dating for three years and my wife went to church and did stuff and I never went she'd take the kids and always ask and I would be like no that's all right football's on you know you've been there football's on Sunday church should be a different day no. So, so as we were going, we're three years dating. She came to me and said, listen, I, I really think this can go farther and that we could get married. But if we're going to get married, you have to go to church. And being the smart man that I think I am, you know, tests would show otherwise, but that I think I am, I said, okay, I'll go to church. That was easy. If God only knew that's how easy it is for guys to go to church, just have somebody you want to marry ask you, and then you'll go. So I started going to church, and it wasn't for the right reason, but I started going. I told her, if I'm going to church, it's going to be Catholic church. I'm not going to one of those crazy churches. So she said, okay. So we went to Catholic church, and we didn't have the boys. It, it was crazy how it came up, lined up. One weekend, we had no kids. The next weekend, we had all six kids. So the first weekend we decided to go to church, we had no kids, so we went to Catholic church. She went and, and went through that. The next weekend we had the kids, so we're going to Catholic church. And after the church was done, she came to me and said, listen, I can't put my kids through that. They had no children's ministry. Not that the Catholic church was bad. They just had nothing for kids. And they sat in there. My kids never went to church, so it, was nothing, it wasn't new or different for them. But her kids, she goes, I can't do that. We have to go. Can we go to Christian church when we have the kids? and go to Catholic church when we don't. I said, sure. So we started bopping around to churches, and nothing, just going and, and changing. At least we knew that was going to be consistent. Well, we moved out to Surprise, Arizona, and we didn't have the kids. We're going to Catholic church one day, and I don't go anywhere late. If you, if you ask me, hey, let's, let's, we're having a barbecue. Come on over at 6. I'll be there at 545. Just, just let you know I'm early. So if you're a last-minute tidy-upper, don't invite me until 6.30, because then I'll be 
For you, I'll be late. But for me, I'll still come 15 minutes early. All right. So I go, we're not going to church today. Let's get in the car, go get something to eat because I love food. And I can go to a restaurant any single time, any day, any time there's an excuse to go eat, I will do it. So she goes, no, we got to go to church. We've been doing this consistently. I go, she goes, what if I find a church that hasn't started? I said, all right, if you find a church, I'll go. We're driving down the road, and in a school, elementary school, there's a church. It hasn't started yet, so we pull in and go in, and, and worship was going on, and it was crazy to me. I wasn't, I didn't know worship. I didn't have, and a Catholic church I grew up in, we didn't, they didn't have worship. A guy played a acoustic guitar, and they sang hymn stuff, and that's it. So we went in there, listened to the message, and I, told, I looked at her and I said, we're going here. She goes, what do you mean? I go, we're going here. And we started going. The next week, we took the kids. And after, church, after service was done, I go, hey, can I stay and tear down? She's like, yeah. So I, tear, I tore down. I, I, we didn't miss church. We started going. And it was Trent's uh, church. He started in surprise. And I couldn't, it, I never heard something so passionate and real. So I wanted to keep listening. So I kept going. We didn't miss. And I was anxious. And we'd come and sit in the front and my wife doesn't like sitting in the front, but she sit in the front for me. And then we started going. I started reading a little bit, and things started changing in my life. And I started um, learning a little bit, and I was so excited because I never knew anything. I never opened the Bible before that time. And I started reading and, and asking, and things started changing. I, I told you I coached high school football here at Peoria High School, and one of my former students went on to ASU and played football there, and he was actually shot and killed by another ASU player. And I went to the candle vigil they had at Peoria, and my parents, I love my parents, we still talk like five times. They still live in New York. We, I call them five times a week, and we talk, and we have a great relationship. And they, they raised me to treat others better than myself and to do these things. And I was like, I'm going to go there, and I'm going to, to I'm gonna just support this family no matter what they need. And as I was getting down there, the dad gave me this big old bear hug, and he said, God is good. And I didn't understand that. I couldn't understand that. How is God good right now in your life? And I started reading the Word, and I opened up the Bible, and I finished it in three months. I couldn't put it down. And I started reading, and, and I kept emailing Trent every single day. I would hear something new, and I would write it and email. And my wife's like, you can't email him every single day. I said, I have to know this stuff. I don't know any of this. And he would answer back. And as it went on, I started writing and, and learning. And I, said, I finished the Bible. And I said, God, there's got to be something more. I want to read it again. And I read through it again. And I, after I was done, I said, God, there's got to be more. Please, every time I read this, show me something. Show me a way I can be better. I can change me and, be li and live different. See, sometimes we get confused because we think knowledge is power. See, some of us have been taught that knowledge is power. And knowledge just puffs us up. Applied knowledge is power. If we don't apply our knowledge to our life, if we don't apply the word to our life, we just have a lot of, a lot of information. And it's not doing us any good. See, when we put it into action and we apply it, now life changes. And now things start to happen. And I started doing that and seeking that and started writing and, and, and asking and seeking. And I wrote my testimony and typed it out. And I sent it to Trent. And he emailed me back and said, I want you to share this at our grand opening. We just had a building built, and we started services in the, in the summer. And in August, we're going to have that grand opening. And he goes, I want you to share your testimony. And I was like, no, man, this was for you. I'm not sharing it in front of people. And you, if you've met Trent, and if you're new here, you're going to meet Trent. He's persuasive. So he got me to do that, and he, he talked me into it. And I, I did that. And as I started growing and learning, I, I started getting, getting more excited to, to know more and do more. And, and Trent had called me in the winter, and I was coaching tennis at Sunrise Mountain High School. And he called me and he asked me, hey, do you think you could do part-time work and do small group director and help me get small group started? And I was like, yes, I'd love to. Because we had already been starting to teach a Bible study, he had been, and he asked me to help him at Shuff Steel, a company downtown. And we would go in on Wednesdays and do that. So I said, yeah, I'd love to. I started doing small groups. A year and a half later, we're driving down to Shuff Steel, and he looks at me and goes, hey, Keith, why should I hire you? I was like, yeah, 
You don't have to. I, I, I'm doing this all for Jesus. I have such a passion. I, I, I'll do it for free. He goes, that's why I need to hire you. He goes, well, it'll cost him nothing for one. But I go, for two, he goes, man, but I can't. I need a director that can do all adult ministries and has a background. And you have no background in, in theology or no background in this at all. But I keep praying. And every time I pray, the Holy Spirit keeps giving me your name. And he goes, would you leave teaching? I said, yeah, I'll try. I have two weeks before school started. It was in July. And I, as soon as we got back from Shuff Steel, I jumped in my car and drove to Sunrise Mountain. And the principal there was a good guy, but not a believer. And I, I went in his office. I'm like, going, hey, can we meet? He goes, yeah, what's up? I go, hey, I have an opportunity. I know it's two weeks before school starts, but I have a chance to be in full-time ministry. He goes, listen, he goes, I'll do you one favor. He goes, I'll, get, I'll, I'll let you out of your contract. I'll give you a sabbatical. You go into ministry. If you don't like it, I'll give you your job back. And that was unheard of in teaching. And I said, oh, that's awesome. I got in my car. I'm driving home. I called Trent. Hey, Trent, my principal said I can get out of my contract. He's going to give me a year sabbatical. And if, he, if I don't like it, I can come back. He goes, good, because you're on probation. If we don't like you, you're going back. So I started in ministry, and I started taking in more and more. And as I shared this, it's because it's, it's amazing how it ties in with this, with this passage. of the, I love this inspired series of the red letters. So right now, as we go, if we can stand, I want to read um, the red letters and the commands of Christ together. In reverence, we always stand. Matthew 8, 1 and 4 says, Large crowds followed Jesus as he came down the mountainside. Suddenly, a man with leprosy approached him and knelt before him. Lord, the man said, if you are willing, you can heal me and make me clean. Jesus reached out and touched him. I am willing, he said, be healed. And instantly, the leprosy disappeared. Then Jesus said to him, don't tell anyone about this. Instead, go to the priest and let him examine you. Take along the offering required in the law of Moses for those who have been healed of leprosy. This will be a public testimony that you have been healed or been cleansed. Let's pray. Dear God, I thank you so much for your love. I ask you to speak through me today and open our hearts and our minds to, to hear something that you want us to hear and to change us and to move us, to help us grow to be better followers and fully devoted followers of your son, Jesus. I ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated. I love this tie-in because if you think about it, and this is, not, this is now, but leprosy was pretty bad. Okay, people, when they had leprosy, people didn't touch them. They were unclean. People avoided them at all costs. So I don't know how many years he had this, but he had leprosy. No one would have touched him. And when he asked, Jesus reached out and touched him first. See, he didn't go, whoa, you got leprosy. You clean up a little bit and come on back and let's pray and we'll do something. No, he reached out and touched them and said, I am willing. Be healed. And he was healed instantly. That is amazing to me because that's what happened in my life. I, I look at it and go, I was divorced twice. I was not living a very good life. I was lost. And, and Trent didn't want to hire me. But he led in worship and led through the Holy Spirit and said, man, the Holy Spirit keeps telling me to hire you. I'm going to take a chance. He reached out and he made an impact. And us as Christians need to see that. We don't have to see the outside and, and be nervous and, and be wondering. See, Jesus didn't hesitate. And we as Christians don't need to hesitate we need to be willing to open up and let invite everyone we can to Christ Church of Fountain Hills. See, our goal should be that this, every seat is filled in this service, last service. You know, we should, we should be so excited that we have a next service. And we should go, Trent, we need to open three services. We should have four services. And to be, be thoughtful of the staff, we should pray and say, man, I hope that this we get enough finances to knock out these walls and make a thousand-seat auditorium so we can go back to two services. 
and keep growing. See, our mindset should be to grow, to learn, to open up, and not let anyone not know Jesus. Because I know at 37, when I accepted Jesus as my Lord and Savior and started seeking him out, what a difference. There was a joy. There was a peace. There was so many things that changed in my life. I was still me, who God created me to be. I just knew now that there was a purpose. See, we all have a purpose. See, Trent opened up and listened. And as we go today, I want to I share and I want to hope and I'm, I'm going to tie in some points, hopefully that will make us all, me included, continue to step towards Christ because we're not going to be perfect. None of us. But our goal, our goal in life should be that we keep stepping towards Jesus and keep growing and learning to be like him. See, Jesus doesn't wait for us to be clean. I want you to get this. Jesus doesn't wait for us to be clean, and then he did stuff. He cleans us. We come to him however we are, and Jesus cleans us. And to me, that is just amazing, and it should push us through, and it should motivate us to do whatever we can to shine a light in Fountain Hills. And if we know anyone that does not know Jesus, we should invite them and open up to have them come here. We have two services right now. Man, you should invite someone every week, have someone new with you. And that's a challenge. That's, that's cool. That's exciting to me. As I come here and I've met people the last week, I'm just encouraged. I'm excited to be in this town. My wife and I moved up here uh, two weeks ago and got settled in, and we're just, we're just anxious. We've been driving around, checking out things, trying to see what's here, and try to, try to get out in the community. And that's what we have to do. So a few things I want you to think about as we go on, and I think they'll help us. Number one is don't fear. Listen what fear is. The definition of fear is an unpleasant emotion caused by the belief that someone or something is dangerous, likely to cause pain or a threat. See, many times fear keeps us from doing what we know we need to do. As fully devoted followers of Christ, we know we should be going into the community, the Great Commission. We should go, connect, grow, go. We should go and we should invite. We should teach them, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, teaching them all the commands. See, we should do that. And sometimes fear gets us locked up. And if it's not you, it's me. Sometimes I get like, oh, I don't know if I should invite that person. I don't know. I want to work through that, and I want to grow every day. And also what fear does to us, and this isn't a negative thing sometimes, but it can come off as a negative. It keeps us comfortable. See, we're like, oh, I love this. We go here, the same people, and I love to see everyone, and it's great. And we stay comfortable. We don't want change. And when change happens, we get locked up. And that, that change that is happening, we don't want to be a part of sometimes. And I love the fact that Trent called me and asked me, what do you think? See, I came from a church that I didn't need to leave. I wasn't looking for a job. I said, Trent, if it's clear and God is calling me and I'll pray with my wife and we'll talk about it and discuss it, if it's clear as day, I will come to Fountain Hills. And it was clear as day. Are we willing to let fear go? Because it's all new. And then my first week, he says, you're preaching. I could let fear lock in because, man, you guys could be staring at me like daggers. It's lucky that it's lights in my eyes. I can't really see you guys. No, just kidding. But it, it's, fear can lock us in comfort, and that is not a good thing. See, Jesus reached out first. He didn't hesitate. He reached out and says, I'm willing be healed. Trent reached out. I know in his flesh he was reluctant, but he reached out because the Holy Spirit, see, he was in tune with what the Word said. He didn't let the fear of, oh, I can't hire him, stop him. He said, okay, if it's through the Word and the Spirit is telling me, I'm going to do it. And that's where we got to let go and let God and keep moving in his ways. When we are focused on Jesus, we start realizing that we are the church. See, this is not church. 
We are the church. This, these walls are a building. We get to come here. We get to grow and learn together. It's important that we come together. But we are the church. When we leave, we are still the church. We can't stop being excited to say, man, you've got to come to my church. It's the best church. Now, don't get me wrong. It's not the only church. There's churches out. We don't want to battle churches for people. We want to battle the lost and get them to know who Jesus is. So we need to go out there and share. And, and I, I, I've grown to really love to share what I do. So when we were moving out here from Surprise, I rented movers. It was June. I, got, I called up somebody, come move me. And when they got there, I was sharing. They were working. They were loading the truck up, and they were talking. I'm like, they're like, what do you do? I'm a pastor. Oh, I, the one guy said, oh, I've never gone to church. But my kids keep asking me, but I don't know. I go, man, here, here's, a, here's the address. Come to church. And he never did while I was there. But I can't worry about that. I can just invite and just keep inviting. Look what Hebrews says. Hebrews 13, 2. Don't forget to show hospitality to strangers. For some, some who have done this, having and, um, entertained angels without realizing it. You don't know who you're going to ask. They might be a non-believer that come in, accept Jesus, and they might be the, the, the next biggest thing out there. And people, they might lead a, a hundred, thousands of people to Christ, and you don't ever know if you never gave the ask. Get out there. Be willing. Open up. I, I saw there's invite cards in the front office. In, take some. Invite people. And celebrate with them. Don't let fear hold you and lock you in a comfort zone. Let it go. Number two, be willing. We have to be willing to reach the unchurched. That has to be a desire of ours. I know not knowing God and not believing in Jesus for 37 years, when I finally knew him, man, I don't want anyone not to feel this way. I want people to enjoy this. There's a, there's a peace and a joy you can only have from knowing Jesus. And if someone's out there that doesn't know Jesus, I don't want them to feel that way. Life is tough. Let Jesus come along and give us the strength that we can do things. With that said, we also have to be willing to grow and mature, to, to grow outside of our comfort and to move in ways that Jesus wants us to move. And that is growth. That is learning. I love that we have life journals. I think that's a huge way. In this part right here, am I willing to grow and learn and take the knowledge I'm reading and write it down and then look at it and try to live it? On the bottom of the life journal, I'm not quoting this perfectly, but I know it says, Hell, how is this going to help you be better today? That's how we should live our life. How can it be better today? Because we're not going to be perfect. We might mess up. We might struggle. But God, help me through this. Show me something. And all of a sudden we read his word. And we're willing to grow and listen. And all of a sudden we start stepping better. And we start shining a light. And the light that shines, its darkness flees, it says. And we start growing. Man, you got to get a life journal. you got to start. Then you can look back. I've got stacks of journals that I've done now for the last 11, 12 years. And I can look back in 19, or 2019. Um, 2006 and see that I wrote a, a journal on a scripture and look back at 2012 and see I wrote a, a, a journal on the same verse and it was just touching me different at that time in my life. And it has made an impact and I can continue to grow. As I was studying for this, I read a lot of devotions and I, I'm trying to, to research always. And I, I, I read an article from this guy, Ken Costa, and it's amazing. He was born in South Africa. He's not a pastor, but he, he's a banker, and he, he's done very, he was very successful in the business world, and he wrote a book, God at Work. And I love it. It's not about God being at work in our lives like you would think. It's about God at work. At his work, he's bringing God there. And I love meeting Chad and listening to Chad's story about being being called by God to, to leave here as a pastor and go be a pastor at a job in the world again. And that is cool because we are all pastors. We all have an outreach. We all have a job we have that we can reach people that I cannot reach and, and Trent cannot reach. So we step up and we do that. 
And he said this, he said, part of Christian faith, part of being willing to dream means being willing to fail. It means being willing to take risks for God in the knowledge that God is in control and we are not. See, well, I want to take a risk. Like I said, when Trent asked me, hey, would you ever consider coming to Fountain Hills? I said, I will pray about it. If it's clear, I'm coming. I'm taking a risk. We're moving out here. If it's clear, and it was clear, ask me the story sometime. It, there is no more clarity than I had from coming out to Fountain Hills. But we have to understand that when we do this, we might fail sometimes. We might invite somebody. They might say no. We can't let that discourage us. All we can do is plant seeds and water them. See, it's not our job to make it grow. And when we get caught up in, well, I've asked 10 people and only one came and the other nine didn't. I don't want to ask anymore. That's not our job. God makes it grow. We just, just keep asking. And keep asking because that ask, that plant, that seed we plant, that watering we do by encouraging them and we work with them, you never know when they're going to have a moment where they want to come to church then. And it might not be you. It might be someone else that asked them. I was sharing with a, one of the guys after the first service and my parents, being Catholic, they really didn't understand when I accepted Christ and they got baptized my mom especially, but I, I, I started writing a blog and, and sending out scriptures. Three years my dad got them, never said a word. One day he called me for his birthday. He goes, hey, I got a book for my birthday. Joe Gibbs was his favorite um, football coach. He goes, Joe Gibbs' book, Game Plan for Life. He goes, I read it, and it all things about Jesus and how Jesus led him in football and led him in car racing and all this stuff. It's pretty cool. Can you send me your blog? I said, I've been sending you for three. I didn't say that. But I was like going, but it wasn't me. I just planted a seed. Someone else watered it. And that's what God tells us. And God will make it grow. It's not our job. Look what John 15, 5 says. It says, yes, I am the vine. You are the branches. Those who remain in me and I in them will produce much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. Apart from him, we can do nothing. We can do whatever we think we want to do, and we'll have some success, but it will be nothing that is fruitful and, and what God's purpose is for us, and that is to reach out and be used to shine a light. Are we excited to be here at Christ Church of Fountain Hills? I am, and I want these seats filled. And I want to do everything I can, meeting you guys, encouraging you guys and you ladies, and getting people here and saying, let's keep going, because they're going to know the truth. They're going to learn truth. They're going to learn love. They're going to learn friendship. They're going to have family. And that's so important. We need to be willing. Trent was willing to take a chance. And I've been in church now since Parkway for, for 11 years on staff at a church. And I always, I share this with people all the time, and it's not a, a bragging moment. I've been, I've worked as a pastor at four churches in the valley and never applied for one. I know my calling. I know God who has me done, doing a purpose. And like I said, that does not mean that our purpose, your purpose is not good or different. It's just, are we listening? Are we going to reach out to people? Are we going to shine a light? Are we going to make a difference? Are we willing? Because when we're willing, the Bible starts being real. And look what it says in Luke chapter 8, verse 15. And the seed that fell on the good soil represents honest, good-hearted people who hear God's word, cling to it, and patiently produce a huge harvest. See, they hear God's word, and then they cling to it. And then they're patiently waiting for a harvest. They don't get all anxious and go, they're just going to do what God wants them to do. They're going to listen to the word. They're going to get in a, in a life group. They're going to sharpen iron with people. They're going to write in their journal. They're going to learn it. They're going to read it and they're going to do it. And all of a sudden, when they start doing it, they're patiently clinging to it. People see a difference. When a dad hugs you and says, God is good when his son was shot and killed, I still don't get it. All I know is he had a relationship with Jesus. 
And Jesus got him through a moment that should be a breaker. And he flourished. And what he did in shining that light has changed my life. And now I, I, I am so clear and so, so into studying and developing and growing and learning with people because I do not know it all. I try to learn from everyone I can. And that's what we just need to do. It's amazing. And as we are willing, we have no fear. It leads us into our next point, our third point. It's for all. It's for all. It's not for us to pick and choose who's clean, who's not clean, who's worthy to go to church. We should want everyone. God says he's slow, the Bible says, to send Jesus. He doesn't want anyone to miss out. That part for us is to invite everyone we can to know Jesus or to come to church and give them opportunity to grow. We can't ca get caught up. Eh, this might offend them. Just do it. That's the title for the message today. Just do it. It'll, be a, it'll make a difference in their lives. See, and also, it's not about just what we know. If we don't plug in to Jesus, the source, okay, we're just spin our wheels Plug into the source. Do it with purpose. Do it knowing the word. Do it, and you don't have to be a, 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 a genius and know it. Oh, I can't talk to that person. I don't know the word enough. Don't, don't know it to, to have to say it out there. Live it. It'll come. God will give you the words to say when you need them. He's here with us always. A couple weeks ago, Trent shared a message. And yeah, I was listening to, to Trent's messages and, and, and trying to get in tune with the commands of Christ. But he shared a message. He said, when you get the who right, all the do right will happen. When you get the who right, our job is to get the who right. It's Jesus. Through Jesus is the only way to heaven. There's no other way. He is the way, the truth, and the life. That's it. No one comes to heaven about, except through Jesus. But when we start understanding that, the right will come. The things we do will line up. Look what Paul says, 2, Peter, or 2 Timothy 4, 6, and 8. Paul says, as for me, my life has already been poured out as an offering to God. The time of my death is near. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race, and I have remained faithful. And now the prize awaits me, the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give me on the day of his return. And this prize, listen, I love this part. I love all the parts of the word, but listen right here. He says, and this prize is not just for me, <clears throat> but for all who eagerly look forward to his appearing. Are you eagerly looking forward to his appearing? I am eagerly looking forward to Jesus coming back. And while I'm here and I'm excited to do that, am I eagerly waiting and shining so other people can hear it? See, because we don't make people eagerly seek. I can't make you eagerly seek. But I can share and shine a life and be, be, have, a, have such a, a passion and a love for the Lord that it might rub off. You've got to have your own personal relationship. You have to say, God, show me, and he'll come. When we start that together, and man, and I want to start together with you guys at CCFH and make a difference and be family and reach out there and let's get everyone possible we can get from Fountain Hills here. And then when we get Fountain Hills taken care of and we're going to have people come here, let's go to Scottsdale. Let's go farther. Let's get people to come because we're so excited to be here and to learn and we love this place. Let's make a difference. Let's not let fear control us. Let's be willing and let's remember, it's for everyone. I want to end with a story. I was reading, and this story popped up in, 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 in my journal time, and I thought it fit perfect in here. This guy, and he used to take his daughter to Chick-fil-A. Once a week, they would go together, father and daughter. And she was younger. She would go play in the um, jungle gym area or whatever it's called now. And he would, they would eat, and then he would get an ice cream and drive home. Well, this one time, they went and ate. She played so much, she was tired. And she was going out. She goes, Dad, can we get our ice cream and eat here today? And he was like, yeah, sure thing. We usually go home, but we can eat here. So as they got their ice cream, they, they went over, and they sat right near 
the closest booth next to the register. They just wanted to sit there. And as they were sitting eating their ice cream, a homeless guy came in. And he was all full of mud and, and hair all messed up and just looked scraggly. And everyone was kind of giving him that, that look. Like something's wrong with him. And he was just happy-go-lucky coming in. And he got in line and he was waiting in line. And a manager came out and said, he goes, hey, can I just have some scraps? I don't have any money. Can I just have some scraps you're not going to sell and they're left over? Can I have those? And he's like, man, I can't do that legally. But I'll give you a full meal if you let me do one thing. I, uh, if you let me do one thing with you. He's like, what's that? He goes, let me pray with you. And he started to pray right there. And the dad was like, oh. And his daughter's like, what are you doing? He's praying for him right there. See, he didn't care about the line. And you know sometimes Chick-fil-A gets pretty packed. There's a long line, and sometimes we have to wait. And I don't understand we have to wait. It's chicken. There's no decision has to be made. What are you going to have? Chicken. <laughs> I still want to get a hamburger there one time just because. I just don't understand just chicken. But, but, but people sometimes get frustrated with lines. Sometimes they don't want to wait. And he didn't care. This manager just sitting there praying. He didn't care. Man, this could cost me $40 if people leave because we're taking time to pray. No, he didn't care. He let it all go. And the dad was so excited that his daughter could see faith in action, living it out, that, man, what a moment, because I want my kids to see not just me and my wife doing it, but other people around them doing it so they can go, man, it's not just about people that talk about their Christian walk. Because, you know, we can't bash anyone with Bibles. We just got to love them. We gotta, we gotta be different. We gotta do all things we can to get people to come and hear about Jesus. And his daughter could see that. And see, there's differences when we just let go and we don't let anything control us. We just do it. Let's pray. Dear God, I thank you so much for your love. I thank you for everyone here at Christ Church of Fountain Hills today. I ask you just to, to open us up and to open our hearts and help us step in and just do it. Make us different and keep growing us and, and making us stronger, making us fully devoted followers of your son. I know we're not going to be perfect, but I, I just ask you right now, in, in our weakness, give us the strength and have us go out in the Fountain Hills and just invite people to know Jesus. I thank you, I love you, and I ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Jesus is calling